Welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Slickbaum. Here on the Aerospace Advantage, we speak with leaders in the DoD, industry, and other subject matter experts to explore the intersection of strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. So if you like learning about aerospace power, you are in the right place. To our regular listeners, welcome back. And if it's your first time here, thank you so much for joining us. As a reminder, if you like what you're hearing today, do us a favor and follow our show. Please give us a like and leave a comment so that we can keep charting the trajectories that matter to you most. As most know, Mitchell Institute's senior fellows spend their year executing research, writing reports, and coming up with recommendations about key national security issues. Their work circulates in the Pentagon, in Congress, and the broader defense community. These efforts focus on strategy, operational concepts, technology, capability gaps, and budget considerations through the air and space lens. It all comes down to ensuring our women and men in uniform get what it takes to fight and win in air and space. So in that vein, we are really excited to preview one of our signature efforts from 2023, the findings from a war game we conducted earlier this year and a corresponding report that explores the role collaborative combat aircraft will likely play in tomorrow's air superiority mission, especially against a peer adversary like China. And to define our terms up front, Collaborative Combat Aircraft, or CCAs for short, are next-generation uncrewed aircraft with autonomy and artificial intelligence technologies that will partner with other CCAs and crewed aircraft to execute combat missions. That's a big step past remotely piloted aircraft that we've fielded for the past few decades. Mitchell is releasing a report on this next month that Mark Gunzinger and Major General retired Larry Stutz Stutzream and Bill Sweetman drafted. So today's episode is a sneak peek at what the war game revealed and what we can expect to see in the report. Bottom line, this work is extremely important given that our Air Force's air superiority capability and capacity advantage is eroding relative to the Chinese pacing threat. While there aren't any silver bullets out there to solve this, and you hear us talk a lot about the need to accelerate F-35 production, keep modernizing F-22 until NGAD hits flight lines, and solve the perennial fighter pilot shortfall, improve training, and boost readiness, another key opportunity involves Collaborative Combat Aircraft, or CCAs. They promise to help provide additional combat mass and effects required to help reset this crucial mission area for peer conflict. So, to talk about what they've learned from their extensive research and wargaming on this topic, we are speaking to Mark Gonzo Gunzinger, Larry Stutz Stutzream, and Mike Dom. They were all key players in Mitchell's war game, and obviously Gonzo and Stutz are the report authors. Now get ready because this one is an eye opener. Well, Gonzo, Mike, Stutz, welcome back to the Aerospace Advantage. Good to be back and great topic today, Slick. Glad to be back, Slick. Hey, Slick, congrats on the success of your podcast. It's a pleasure to be back. Well, thanks so much, Stutz. I really appreciate that. Well, listen, guys, we really need to just jump right in. You uh, are just getting ready to release your newest report on CCA, and I got to tell you, it's really eye-opening. And the one question that I have, and I know that a lot of other folks will have, is why the current focus on CCAs and the Air Force's modernization bill is already really high with things like F-35, B-21, KC-46, GBSD, T-7, right? And there's a lot more, but why does the Air Force need another new weapon system? Yeah, Gonzo here. I'll take that one. Why the Air Force is developing CCA is a good starting point. Now, our Air Force is too small, its combat forces are too old, and they lack enough aircraft for survivability uh, that's going to be needed to operate in highly contested environments that would exist during a conflict with China or even in the future Russia. So after subtracting test training and non-mission ready aircraft, our airmen may have less than a thousand fighters to meet their global operational commitments, not just operate in a, a campaign against China. Now, breaking that down a bit more, DOD-directed force cuts and modernization program delays over the last 30 years really hollowed out the Air Force's uh, air security forces, which still include aging F-15C fighters that were designed in the 1970s, less than half of its original requirement of F-22s, and of course, 44-year-old E-3 AWACS. So, Independent analyses indicate that air security mission requirements alone in a defense of Taiwan scenario 
could exceed by at least half the Air Force's F-15 CD and F-22 inventories. And let's not forget that inadequate budgets and directed cuts forced the Air Force to divest its attrition reserves. And that alone could be a decisive factor in a high-intensity conflict uh, with China. So by focusing on the Air Force's air security force, we focused our war game on that for a couple of reasons. The first is, obviously, air security is an essential baseline requirement for any joint operation to defeat Chinese aggression in the Pacific, which is, of course, the pacing challenge for sizing and shaping our military. And the lack of air security would greatly increase risk for all U.S. forces in a major European conflict. Now, neither Ukraine or Russia have been able to achieve air security, and the result is they are now locked in a drawn-out war of attrition. That's not war of the future as we envision it. Another reason is the Air Force will not have the resources to acquire, acquire all the high-end weapon systems it needs to fill its existing capability and capacity gaps. So, fielding lower-cost CCAs, initially for county air missions as part of its Next generation air dominance family of systems, that's going to help provide the affordable mass the Air Force desperately needs for counter air missions. Now, of course, a crude six gen fighter will be the linchpin of that family of systems, but it may not be available at scale until you know, the 2030s. CCA acquisition could begin in just a couple of years to help fill our capability and capacity gap, of course, assuming it's not delayed by continuing budget resolutions and other uh, budget reasons. Hey, well, that's so well said, Gonzo. Let me get a little dirtier on this and backtrack a bit on what you asked, Slick, and then double hit a point Gonzo made. Ukraine, if there is ever an example of what war looks like without air superiority, it is from the Ukrainian perspective. Ukraine lacks sufficient modern air power, and it shows, and I'll, I'll boldly say here, that if Ukraine fails, it won't be for lack of dollars, but a lack of modern air power. How many times in history, Gonzo, we've seen, you know, our national security leaders have learned the lesson. They've witnessed devastating power the Air Force brings, but then ignore it or we're starve it of resources. Shaq. Yeah. So air superiority allows land and sea forces to move into the fight and survive. And without that air power, all spirals into a morass where the force that can suffer the most attrition wins. And right now, the withholding of support for air power capabilities after, uh, what, nearly two years leaves Ukraine the odds-on loser in my mind. Even the introduction of remotely piloted aircraft like the MQ-9 Reaper could disrupt the Russians. But another, another discussion there. So given the powerful leverage air power brings, an observer might ask and say, hey, th there's a lot of fighters uh, out there. All the services have these fighter aircraft. Well, let me focus on those fighters. The Navy and the Marine Corps have fighter aircraft as well as the Air Force, but those precious and powerful aircraft are used for very different purposes. We see that in a highly contested fight with China the Navy's carrier aircraft will be dedicated to protecting the carrier and the rest of the carrier battle group. So Marine and Navy Air is tasked with supporting their service missions first and foremost. The Air Force is the service tasked to establish air security for theater-wide needs and to project that globally. And there's not enough. So CCAs provide a path in the intermediate term to help recover the force of the Air Force, its capacity and capability to really keep up with the demands, especially in highly contested conflict. Yeah, thank you both for that context and how we got here. You know, it definitely seems like we're a victim of our own successes in many ways and the delays and in investments to ensure that we remain on top have you know, just been tabled for too long. And people need to recognize that the fighter force that exists today isn't the one that they envisioned from the end of the Cold War. And we say it all the time, it's, it's, small, it's old, it's fragile, you know, plus we've said also that the enemy has a vote, right? So in that vein, Mike, I want you to walk us through China's ability to ensure that their airspace as part of the war fighting strategy, uh, you know, and the threat that it, it poses to joint operations. So this may take a little time, Slick, but I'll try to keep it short. So China's developed significant capabilities to defend its own airspace. And really within the last 
10 or 20 years, the People's Liberation Army or PLA has developed capabilities to actually contest airspace well out into the South China Sea and into the Pacific Ocean past the first island chain, right? First island chain defined by Taiwan, the Philippines, and the islands of Japan. So as you might expect, the closer you get to the Chinese coast, the greater the challenges. The U.S. military splits responsibility for airborne air defense and land-based air defense between the U.S. Air Force and the Army, respectively. But in China, other than short-range air defense forces embedded with Army maneuver units, all land-based long- and medium-range air defense belongs to the PLA Air Force. The threat density along the Chinese coast is profound, overlapping coverage from radars operating in different frequency bands, as well as surface-to-air missiles or SAMs like China's HQ-9 or the Russian S-400 with maximum ranges out to over 200 nautical miles. So in a combat scenario, you've got those SAMs lined up along the coast, and then PLA Air Force fighters are going to be placed beyond the land-based missile engagement ranges to extend air defense coverage even farther and, you know, those airborne capabilities also bring a capability to address low altitude threats. The PLA Air Force has probably reached and in some cases exceeded U.S. Air Force air-to-air missile engagement ranges, and I'll talk about that in a little bit in a minute. But beyond PLA Air Force areas of responsibility, the PLA Navy then picks up the baton and can provide air and air defense coverage with carrier-based fighters, which granted is still a pretty new capability for the PLA. More significantly, they have ship-based threats, which include the uh, maritime version of the HQ-9, the HHQ-9, which again has a maximum engagement range against larger aircraft out to over 200 nautical miles. So all of that air defense threat density is managed by this redundant, resilient, survivable command control communications, computer intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance system of systems, what we call C4 ISR. Right. And as far as the ISR and radar coverage goes, again, the closer you get to the Chinese coast, the worse it gets. On top of all that, we should probably dedicate a podcast to how fantastically bad the PLA electronic warfare threat is. So this is airborne and ground based communications jamming, data link jamming, radar jamming, GPS jamming. And if we had more time, I'd tell you all about the PLA Air Force passive defenses. So this is, you know, hard and deeply buried command centers, aircraft bunkers built into the side of mountains, and an extensive program for camouflage, concealment, and deception, which includes hundreds of airborne decoys. But wait, there's more. (laughs) The PLA isn't sitting there in a defensive crouch waiting for us to attack. We'll talk about this more in a bit, but the PLA will take every opportunity to strike first and strike often to hit U.S. military C-4 ISR and air bases. They're going to target and retarget air bases and runways with cruise missiles and ballistic missiles, knowing that it's easier to destroy us on the ground than fight us in the air. Mm. The bottom line, China's presenting us with a layered, dense, survivable, electromagnetically complex threat environment that just gets worse and worse as you ingress to a Taiwan operating area. It's a wicked hard problem, and the U.S. Air Force needed a solution to these challenges yesterday. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And one thing that I just want to point out, because when I hear something like, oh, this thing has a range up to 200 miles, it's like, well, okay, a range up to 200 miles. No, the listeners need to realize, like, that's like a laser beam. So if an airplane, you know, is 199 miles away from this threat system, it's going to get taken out. Like the way that these ranges are calculated, you can't do anything, you know, to maneuver your aircraft to have the missile go by like you see in Top Gun or we saw in Vietnam where you know you could outmaneuver the missile. The, the missiles now have so much maneuvering capability that you can't jink it. You can't get away from it. So to your point, just to really put it in a tactical context, I mean, you can't get within 200 miles of the coast or you're going to die. You're in a big airplane. Now that if they're mobile by being a, you know, a maritime version of the same thing, I mean, that thing could pop up anywhere. You could be thinking you're safe 300 miles off the coast, and then that thing jiggies out 150 miles and turns on, and now you're within that laser threat ring. So anyway, uh, it's, that's, Gonzo, anything else to add there? Yeah, two very quick comments. Uh, a great rundown. I'm impressed that a lot of people do not understand that if we lose the war in the electromagnetic spectrum, we could lose the whole ball. That's going to be a highly contested operating environment. MS. Uh, I have one other thought, and that is our military is not going to have the resources 
to adopt a warfighting strategy and a future force design that requires it to match China's aircraft for aircraft, ship for ship, weapon for weapon. Instead, it's going to need asymmetric operating concepts and capabilities. They're going to offset the PLA's advantages in time, space, logistics, and combat mass. And it's going to have those advantages, as you pointed out, for conflicts that set along the uh, periphery of China, be it the Taiwan Strait or elsewhere in South China Sea. Yeah, Gonzo, uh, Mike's got it right. In fact, Mike, I don't know if you recall this, but during the game, you also kind of warned us, you said, they're not 10 feet tall. They may be about nine feet tall, but not 10 feet tall. And it, it was kind of funny that we got into a discussion that, hey, think about the home field advantage China has, where we have to project vast distances. And a slick, you're talking like a warfighter, and it's pretty exciting. But I'd add to what you said with respect to the lethality of these threats is that the bulk of the Air Force inventory is old generation. It's not survivable against any threat. And so it's going to be withheld or it will die. Uh, so it most likely will be withheld, which means we only have a small inventory of F-35s. We've got our F-22s. Hopefully modernization stays on track with that small group of aircraft. And then we're not going to have those beautiful B-21s in big numbers for a while. So those threats that Mike talked about, really appreciate that, Mike, too, that rundown. You have to think we've got to do something fast and affordable and capable. And I can't wait to get into, you know, some of the discussions of CCAs with respect to the war game slick. Yeah, thanks for all of that. Again, I just, it's hard not to listen to Mike talk and then think, like, what would I do trying to fight in that situation? And that's the eye-opening part. Gonzo, I've got to ask you this. You know, so many argue that essentially we, the U.S., took our eye off the ball for way too long. And, you know, what you and, and many others refer to as a procurement holiday. And I'd suggest that, you know, it also impacted training and readiness in a major way. And Mike explained China took a different path and used the past three decades to build up their capabilities. So how do we make up for lost ground? Yeah, our, our eye is clearly on the ball now. The problem is you have to do more than admire the ball. You have to take action. First, when you want to get out of a hole, it's a good idea to stop digging. Now, translating that to forest structure, it's a good idea to stop trading current forest capacity for future capabilities. Divesting a jet on the ramp doesn't yield enough savings to buy a new jet. And so that's a recipe for an ever smaller forest. And that's exactly what the Air Force has been doing for decades and continues to do so because of its resource shortfalls. Plus, let's not forget, Future capabilities, they don't deter today. And we need to stop eroding our ability to deter China and other adversaries this decade, not in some theoretical distant future. So that means the Air Force should keep its fourth gen fighters and fifth gen F 22s in the force and modernize them as necessary until they can be replaced with new capabilities. It should also double down on next gen capabilities that are already in production, like. The F-35, and of course, fully resourced NGAD development, and that's going to take the support of Congress. Building on my previous point, the Air Force must also invest in new asymmetric capabilities that will allow it to offset China's combat mass advantages. Using CCAs in ways that would disrupt China's anti-axis air denial operations should be a part of that asymmetric approach. That is the number one insight from our 2023 CCA war game. Use CCAs in ways that will disrupt China's air defense operations, not just increase the Air Force's combat mass at range in contested areas. Simply fighting a better mass-on-mass -mass war of attrition would actually constrain the full potential of CCAs. And of course, that's the major theme of the CCA report that we're going to release in January. Well said, Gonzo. You're pretty smart for a bomber pilot. You know that. I, I read a book once. Yeah, I imagine so. Oh, my gosh. I love this podcast. Now, I really get a lot of what you're saying there. And I didn't mention this in the introduction uh, about what collaborative combat aircraft are. But can you help define that for us? And, you know, what are they and how are they different than anything we've seen in the past? Yeah, Gonzo here. I probably should have done that right up front. Briefly, CCA's collaborative combat aircraft 
They're uncrewed aerial vehicles that can operate with other aircraft in contested environments. Now, they're, they're distinct from earlier generation remotely piloted aircraft because the Air Force envisions using them in conjunction with other aircraft to create a distributed, mission tailorable mix of sensors, weapons, and other uh, mission equipment in, like I said, contested environments. Now, CCAs will be semi-autonomous. They're capable of taking uh, high-level direction, as the Air Force has described it, from pilots, and then autonomously implementing that direction. They also may be significantly less expensive than some high-end crewed aircraft, and that would allow warfighters to use them as expendable or even attributable assets, depending on the risk you need to uh, execute emissions. And some CCA variants could cost single digit millions or, or range up to tens of millions of dollars each, depending on their designs and mission systems. So that's just a little thumbnail sketch. So Stutz, what's changed from a technology lens that's allowed CCAs to enter this conversation? Yeah, well, Slick, let's begin by saying the real world is caught up with sci-fi. At Mitchell Institute, as you know, we remain close to technology development, both in the Air Force and across industry. And uh, let me just say, for those not familiar, the future is coming at us fast with respect to technology. So the Defense Department needs to be very tuned in uh, that this is a technology competition faster than ever before. And I, I'll tell you right now, uh, U.S. industry gets that. So there's a number of technologies that have matured to produce an unmanned aircraft, an aircraft with significant capability, and for a reasonable cost, like Gonzo was saying. It begins, I believe, this whole age with the, the ongoing miniaturization of electronic components. We can increase processing power, and we can do some amazing things with less electrical power, less size, and less cost. As you know, just an example, I think about this massive paved tack pod that was so gee whiz on the F-4 when I flew the F-4 in the Philippines. In fact, I flew uh, the first copies of this sensor pod uh, back in 1982, Gonzo. It was, uh, the old paved tack was this electro-optical sensor with a laser designator that was used to guide uh, laser-guided munitions. But it was so huge that if I lost one of my engines on takeoff, the power of my remaining J-79 engine was not enough to remain airborne. I mean, you bail out. So 40 years later, all that and 10 times more, uh, 100 times more, can fit into a Pringles can-sized drone. So a uh, second is sensor technology. It's min miniaturized also, but much more sensitive and discerning across wide ranges of spectrum and when you look at, for example, the MQ-1 Predator video in 2001, and you compare it to a video on MQ-9 Reaper today, well, my gosh, the, the contrast is stunning. So sensor technology is matured. A third technology involves additive manufacturing, also known as printing. Let me say this is one incredible sci-fi-like story. About six years ago, um, we did some research on this, and all we heard about was the limitations and the limiting factors to advancing with additive manufacturing. But today we have companies demonstrating the printing of entire munitions that began with plastics and now they're doing advanced materials, metal alloys. So ad additive means affordable and being able to do engineering designs that were impossible using a, you know earlier industrial age methods. Anyway, finally, there's two big technologies with which glue the concepts of collaborative combat aircraft together, and that's the connectivity and artificial intelligence. The fact that we're moving into a new age to connect bat the battle space means fighters can collaborate with these loyal wingmen from afar. Technologies like laser communications means we can securely spread information across the battle space through a space-based communications architecture. And then finally, of course, AI. Let me make a comparison here. Back in, uh, I think it was 2006, the MQ-4 or RQ-4 Global Hawk took its cross-country voyage uh, from Edwards in California to Maryland. Uh, it demonstrated its airworthiness from takeoff to landing, and that was tough to convince the Federal Aviation Administration to do but that was merely automated. It was pre-programmed. It was robotic. It, it, 
AI is much different in that a CCA would be able to respond to variables in its flight path and in its mission without the need of a human to come in and reprogram it. AI can assess response. So I think all these technologies have merged to make the potential for CCAs to accomplish many functions like ISR strike, you know, what Gonza brought up, and even suppression of enemy air defenses, which is a very complicated mission. So slick, what was once sci-fi is really becoming possible today, and uh, CCAs are a real thing. Yeah, I could not agree more. And having been a, an avionic sensors specialist that I got to train on the, the PAVETAC pod, I mean, that thing is a piece. And your point is just so relevant, Stutz, because for 100 bucks, what you can buy on Amazon was what we wished we had from a clarity standpoint, you know, on our MFD when I first started flying. It. And so I, I, I totally agree. So spot on. So with all of that, Gonzo, you designed the war game to help flesh out, you know, some of our thinking about CCAs. And, you know, this has been a multi-year effort. We hosted a workshop on CCAs in 2022. So can you walk us through what you wanted to learn and how you designed the war game to help deliver insights? Yeah, real briefly. One key to a successful war game uh, workshop, roundtable, is defining the problems or the challenges you want to focus on. Now, I've seen a number of these events fail in the past because their leads simply didn't communicate what they wanted participants to do, and the questions you'd like them to wrestle with. So for our 2023 uh, CCA war game, our priority was to explore different operating concepts. Concepts are using CCAs for three county air missions, fighter sweeps, seed deed, which Stutz will probably talk about a little bit here, and protecting high value airborne assets like our tankers and E7s and so forth from Chinese attacks. And that also required the team leading that effort to figure out how they're going to degrade the PLA Air Force's long-range kill chains. So we assigned players to those three different missions, and that gave us a foundation for comparing their plans and priorities, their concepts for using CCAs, uh, comparing what they did that was similar, what the major differences were, and why. Because that generates a lot of data. But we also played an interactive war game where we had a red team led by our very own Mike Dom uh, to uh, create operational stressors that these planning teams had to address. And that helps inject a degree of realism and uncertainty into war games. But I, I left the, in my opinion, what's the most important game design principle for last, and that's great people. Mitchell brought together world-class operators, planners and technologists from across the Air Force and defense industry communities to wrestle with the operational challenges I, I've mentioned. Now, that's an extremely powerful combination. And of course, I'll add that our teams were led by pros, Curtis Wilson, Otis Winkler, Major General Larry Sutstream. And you. I'll take this opportunity to uh, once again, thank those gentlemen, of course, Mike Dom and your teams for a great effort. Yeah, what a team. I mean, really great. And I want to hear from Stutz because, you know, you've done a lot of these war games over your career. So how did what Gonzo designed stand apart given, you know, the unique challenges that we face today? Yeah, well, let me kind of put this in context that I am often critical of misapplication of war games, and I've seen it across my career. I've seen what I call outcome abuses, putting that in quote, outcome abuses. It results from everything from service parochialisms not being squashed to models that don't reflect reality. You know, models only as good as the data that's fed into it. Uh, if it doesn't reflect the reality of war, why even bother? And I'll say this right now, Mark Gunzinger, our buddy Gonzo here, this guy's a master of putting together the, the right questions in the right environment to really get to the essence of the objective for which that war game is put together. And here's the secret sauce, Gonzo, is you bring together this very holistic group of talent. It's about the people that participate. Exactly right. And it's not just, uh, you know, who's on duty, who's available. It's we know these people and we bring in these groups that need to interact to get that holistic view. So you need your war fighters, first and foremost, one of the most efficient 
dimensions of a lot of the war games I've seen in my career, just not the right guys fresh out of the trenches who bring such reality uh, of the understanding of what it means to fly and fight. Then you have your technologists, your engineers and your scientists that can, in all the you know great ideas that come forward, kind of ground things on what's possible. And in reverse, they are enlightened by understanding deeper and deeper about what it means to be in those operational scenarios. And then, of course, to bring industry in because they're at the leading edge of what's possible and doable, especially in today's world, because of the uh, magic of information. The cycle time of, a, of an idea is very short compared to what it was decades ago. So I, I just I, I think the real secret sauce in this war game was the team that was brought together. Finally, I'll say, and I'll, I'll agree with Gonzo, Mike, you have brought an ingredient to this war game and to Mitchell Institute overall. That red team, your ability to come to each of the three groups and give them feedback and put on enough productive tension really allowed us to pour our thinking and, and question what we were doing and go in different directions and think more openly. And, and that was important to have that, that powerful but uh, not interrupting, not overwhelming red team. It was just perfect, Mike. I just uh, commend you for that. Well, I, I appreciate the compliment, but I'm, I'm not going to go easier on you the next, uh, the next war game. So <laughs> I wouldn't expect that. No. And I will say, I'm, Mike, I'm, just, I'm happy you're not a PLA member. I'm glad you're on our side, by the way, even if you were a red teamer. So anyway, I just, I'll conclude by, you know, saying that right talent was really important. And, uh, you know, that ecosystem in this war game, you know, got us that holistic view. And I thought when we, you know, if we can talk a little bit about the uh, recommendations that came out of this, I think you'll see that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it was a great segue. You know, Mike, you were the lead for the Red Forces. So can you talk to us about the approach that you had to take for that task? And how do you challenge players and their assumptions to hold up, you know, their thinking? Yeah, so it's like when I play red, I try to keep it real, right? I, I think you're doing blue uh, disservice if red just tries to come in as a spoiler, swing it away with a bag yeah. of dirty tricks just to frustrate yeah, right. the blue team, right? So that said, real world PLA operational concepts have actually been designed to counter US capabilities specifically and frustrate US commanders and, and decision makers. So that makes my job fairly easy. But, you know, real briefly, in order to be successful in the battle space, Red wants to achieve what they call the three dominances, information dominance, air dominance, and maritime dominance. And those are pretty much in priority order. The PLA believes it needs battle space information dominance first and foremost, and that allows the PLA Air Force to achieve air dominance and then maritime dominance follows. So in Red's mind, if, if we can't achieve the three dominances, then we have no hope of being successful in a Taiwan invasion or any other large scale operation. So in the course of the war game, Red took several operational approaches to challenge Blue for battle space information dominance and ultimately air dominance. The first approach was to strike first. The PLA has this concept of active defense, which means the PLA will be strategically defensive, but operationally active or offensive. And Red wanted to have that first mover advantage. So we launched strikes against key links and nodes in blue C4 ISR, as well as strikes against blue air bases, aircraft on the ground, and logistics. The second thing Red tried to do was operate in silence. Without red ships and aircraft operating any unnecessary electronic communications or radars that blue might use to target them. But so this is all part of the battle space information dominance strategy I talked about. Red wants to be able to push information to its forces to target blue, but not give up information to blue so that they can be targeted. You know, when we talk about these war games and some of these operational concepts, this is what we've come to call the hider finder challenge in future operations. If everybody goes into a passive mode and no one's emitting electronic signals in the battle space, you may have to cover a lot of ground before you stumble across an enemy target. And I think this is one way that CCAs could contribute to the future fight. Mm. So the third thing that Red did was try to challenge blue assumptions and change up the geometry in the battle space. For the longest time when it came to China, we thought about threats and threat rings radiating from the Chinese mainland, right? one red threat vector coming from the west and flowing to the east. 
But the PLA air and air defense system I described before now extends hundreds of miles from the Chinese coast. And this allows red counter air to come at blue strike packages from different directions. Red counter air may come from the north or the south. Red ships operating in radio silence could even be positioned behind blue formations as they ingress. So blue has to consider a 360 degree threat environment. The other thing very specifically we played in the war game that I hadn't seen before was a Chinese air-to-air missile called the PL-17. This is a missile that the Chinese have produced specifically to kill high-value air assets or HAVA, uh, things like the E-7 Wedgetail Airborne Early Warning and Control Aircraft or air-to-air tankers. The PL-17 has a range of over 200 nautical miles that's going to be launched from a fighter that itself could be a couple hundred miles off of the Chinese coast. So that threat really pushed back blue airborne command and control and tanker orbits, which challenged CCA ranges and uh, crewed aircraft ranges. All right, Gonzo, Stetson, Mike, what did you think you'd get from the war game uh, going into it? And how did the actual experience compare? Did folks meet your expectations or any unique surprises or insights that you saw right off the bat? Yeah, they uh, exceeded my expectations, uh, which is always a good thing. And I w- I'll start with uh, a major surprise. Now, all three of our air security mission planning teams, planning U.S. planning teams, independently proposed to use their CCAs, which they chose from a menu of uh, notional designs. They proposed to use them as lead forces at the start of the air campaign to disrupt and degrade China's air defense operations. And those CCAs included a large number of lower cost variants that could be used as decoys, sensors, and shooters to uh, stimulate PLA's defenses, cause them to react in ways that uh, would reveal their locations, and then pass target cues to weaponize CCAs and, and fifth gen fighters. So the three teams all proposed, and this is independently, not coordinating with each other, they all proposed a two pulse con ops for their missions that first used these CCAs as lead forces and then followed that with a second pulse that consisted of a, a mix of CCAs and fifth gen F 22s and F 35s. So, for the first two days of the conflict, these lead CCA forces predominantly consisted of lower cost, expendable designs that could carry a couple of air to air weapons each. And those expendable CCAs can be launched by non-stealthy B-52s from standoff ranges and from the ground without the uh, need to use runways. The the teams chose those aircraft because they expected most of them would be attrited by the PLA's undegraded defenses at the start of the conflict. But for the next two weeks of the air campaign, the teams chose to use more capable CCAs that could be recovered and then regenerated for additional sorties. And those CCAs could also operate from shorter runways than a a typical crewed fighter, which allowed them, our teams, to create a more distributed posture to counter the red team's air base attacks. Yeah, let me jump in, Slick. I don't have much more to say. Gonzo's pretty much said exactly what stood out to, I think, everybody. So I'll just kind of repeat his observations. Let me emphasize that three working groups did not cross-pollinate, yet they arrived at very similar approaches and perspectives, uh, once again, independently. And that's a significant, I was not expecting that. I thought there would be a little more variety, but then when you stand back and look at, because I led one of the groups, uh, it was not till after the war games analysis, uh, late in the war game, where we discussed what we were doing that, I was just stunned by, wow, we went down the same trails with this. And what it looks like is not just simply a bunch of unmanned, sophisticated, looks like fire aircraft, welded wingmen, you know, operating in close proximity to the F-35s, for example. It was the fact they were being used to judo throw China, to disrupt them, to really force them to commit to everything that was in the battle space, allowing those manned aircraft to to really do things and manage their operations, uh, maximizing the power of what they had on board those very sophisticated aircraft. So the fact that all three groups gravitated toward a lower cost, more unitary or simple uh, mission design 
that varied across their CCAs, but within each CCA might be very, very much more uh, simplistic rather than sophisticated to blunt the defensive advantage of the Chinese. That stood out to me pretty clearly, and it was not expected. You know, so like one of the things that worries me is, uh, I, I guess I would say, blue overconfidence in its ability to access uh, rather C4 ISR and, you know, connectivity. We're focused on developing new operational concepts for uncrewed aircraft, where they would go, how far they would have to fly. That All of that is a very heavy lift in and of itself. But I think we need to start thinking through how will these CCAs receive the data and commands that they need? How will the crewed aircraft that are central to this team also receive the data and commands that they need. And let's be honest, that connectivity is usually represented by lightning bolts on a PowerPoint slide. But attacking those lightning bolts is a key part of the Chinese strategy. Given, given that Chinese strategy, we shouldn't assume that connectivity. They're going to do more than just throw sand in the gears. They're going to go after data links and comm and any type of electronic emissions both kinetically and, and non-kinetically. And I could go on and on about this, but suffice to say that I think we need to build a force that can operate comms dark with only passive sensors. If, if our platforms do emit, they should probably be expendable. Yeah. The other thing that I say that we tend to do in DoD war games is, you know, we play a blue future capability that we're thinking about buying against a current or at least a conventional red threat. But the PLA is developing CCAs and loyal wingmen of their own. I don't think they're as far along as we are, but that future is coming. So I'd like to work on a future war game that incorporates potential future red operating concepts and maybe platforms and weapons that are still on the red drawing board. Yeah, that is a, a great point, and I appreciate you pointing that out. All right, Gonzo and Stutz, you two are the report author, so walk us through the main report findings, if you would. Sure. Um, I've, I'd like to emphasize that these insights and recommendations are from the experts that participated in our war game series. We didn't make them up out of a cloth. These are not Mitchell's recommendations. These are from the pros. At first, they recommended the Air Force create operating concepts for using expendable and tradable CCAs as lead forces to disrupt China's air security operations, as I mentioned, and to complicate the PLA's counter air targeting, identify high value air defense nodes, and, and, and cause the opposition to expend its best weapons on lower cost uncrewed systems. Uh, and ins but instead of relying on CCAs to simply generate more mass, you take these CCAs, combine them with these new disruptive cost imposing concepts, and that would create an asymmetric combination of PLA could find it very difficult to counter. A second, the Air Force is going to need CCAs at scale to increase its capacity to project affordable counter-air mass to do these disruptive operations in highly contested areas. Uh, now, CCAs can be force multipliers in the sense that they can collaborate with other aircraft or operate nearly independently to increase the weapons and the sensors the Air Force can project over long ranges into these highly contested environments we're talking about. Uh, they could also perform as penetrating weapons trucks to help offset the PLA's growing county air force capacity to improve the survivability of our fifth and sixth generation fighters and, of course, multiply the number of weapons they can bring to the fight. Another insight, the Air Force should field CCAs that will help reduce its dependence on large fixed air bases in the Pacific because that would improve the Air Force's resiliency. It would improve its ability to generate combat sorties while under attack. Uh, CCAs that can operate from shorter runways or even launch without using runways, possibly containerized, would help create that more dispersed, resilient posture. And building a network of dispersed CCA operating locations, it would also complicate the PLA's ability to find, fix, and attack our Air Forces, County Air Forces, where they're most vulnerable, which is, of course, on the ground, preparing for combat sorties. Great start, Gonzo. Let, let me follow up with a few other insights. Okay, let's talk about very significant issues with munitions. Uh, our war game experts also recommended the Air Force maximize the lethality 
of weaponized CCAs by actually developing or adapting munitions to take advantage of uh, CCA payload capacity. So let me say, designing CCAs around legacy weapons originally created for crew aircraft, I mean, it doesn't make sense. It risks increasing the CCA size, its weight, and directly its unit cost. So better alternative would be to take advantage of technologies like we talked about earlier, slick, uh, smaller engines, compact rocket motors, uh, miniaturized components to reduce the size of CCA munitions. And, uh, you know, obviously this could also increase weapons per counter air sortie, which is critical to the success to, of operations to, that are intended to rapidly halt and defeat a Chinese offensive. And Gonzo, I think you would agree that in past platforms, aircraft and munitions have been delinked, and that's uh, that's been defunct, dysfunctional, I think, to a large degree, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, okay, another uh, insight from our experts was the need to do a trade-off analysis to determine the optimal mix of CCAs in the future force design of the Air Force. Uh, what, what this was intended to do is balance attributes according to how you're going to use them, such as their size, their observability, which could be low, medium, high, what, depending on what you want to do with that CCA, the range of the CCA, uh, its ability to launch and recover, and so forth. And all that will influence cost in that calculus of, of attributes. So determining the right trade-offs between these features will really inform that analysis. The force design that includes a CCA that maximizes combat effectiveness and, of course, return on investment. There was consensus from the experts during our war game, all consensus, that CCAs will be complementary to manned aircraft, not uh, and they will be additive. They, there, there was clearly the theme that CCAs will not be used to reduce the Air Force requirement for fifth generation fighters or advanced bombers or other crewed systems. CCAs that are, are empowered and they will augment uh, manned aircraft, but they will not replace them. And I thought that was a very important insight from our experts. Yeah, the real leap ahead in capability and capacity comes from figuring out how to best combine right. the attributes that both crew and non-crew yeah. bring to the fight. Exactly. So, Mike, as Mitchell's a China expert, how do you think what Gonzo and Sets are proposing and, and what you saw play out in the war game, you know, would this impact the fight? And are we making the defense equation harder for China? Yeah, Slick, I, I think CCAs are definitely going to make things much more difficult for the PLA. And look, we're keeping the focus on this podcast on CCAs and the report's all about CCAs, but it is worth mentioning that the addition of CCAs all by themselves are not going to win the future fight. And this just reiterates, you know, a lot of what's been said around the table so far. China's presenting this wicked hard, complex threat environment in a multi-domain battle space, and the U.S. military needs to present the PLA with wicked hard problems of our own. But you know, CCAs, the use of autonomous and expendable platforms, pilot machine teaming, artificial intelligence and decision aids, you know, all of that is going to be critical capabilities in a future fight. But even if we could wave a magic wand and have a fleet of CCAs tomorrow, we would still need to address issues with recapitalizing our fighter and bomber force, base defense, logistics, and probably most importantly, the resilience of our battle management and the survivability of our C4 ISR networks. Yeah, I totally agree. The CCAs are not the Band-Aid fix for the world's smallest, oldest, uh, and most fragile Air Force, right? This is additive to everything else that we're doing. So we really need to foot stomp that. And I think we talked about that in the report. But I've got to ask you while I have you, Mike, what does China think about AI and autonomy use? So that's a complicated question. And I know we're getting close to time, so I'll try to keep this tight. But the PLA recognizes the profound impact that AI is going to have on future warfare. But they like us, are still trying to figure out what that looks like. So right now, PLA operational concepts are focused on informationized warfare, warfare transformed by information. And informationized warfare necessarily focuses on battle space information control. I've said that several times in the podcast. Intelligentized warfare is warfare transformed by intelligent systems or artificial intelligence. 
Now, on the one hand, intelligentized warfare can be about the proliferation of lethal autonomous systems, you know, killer robots. On the other hand, and this is what some of my research is focused on, the PLA regards intelligentized warfare as an evolution of informationized warfare. So AI and intelligence systems are being used to enhance battle space awareness and enhance combat decision making. So, you know, you remember John Boyd's OODA loop, right? Observe, orient, decide, act. Well, the Chinese are all about the OODA loop, and they are looking to AI to help their OODA loop ingest more data and turn that OODA loop faster and faster and faster, essentially giving the PLA decision superiority over an adversary like the U.S. In terms of countering U.S. plays for decision advantage, the PLA is going to try to screw with our OODA loop. They're going to use deception, feed us bad data, and most importantly, target our C4IS, our system of systems, our networks. PLA scholars talk about using AI to impose highly persistent paralysis on an adversary's system of systems. AI is going to help a Chinese commander to target key links and nodes in the U.S. system of systems to impose paralysis. And then as U.S. AI tries to self-heal and rewire our networks to reverse the paralysis, China AI will sense and see how U.S. networks are adjusting and then take additional action to keep the U.S. system of systems paralyzed. It's complicated, but this is our future. So this is a longer conversation, but I think one way to counter PLA intelligentized operational concepts is going to be to push data collection, processing of that data, and decision making to the very edge of the network, to the very edge of the blue battle space. Centralized command and control concepts where our combat forces have to reach back to the air operations center or even back to an airborne command and control platform could be very vulnerable to PLA attacks that seek to paralyze our networks. Sending a pilot on his or her way with a you know mission orders and an organic network of CCAs to sense the battle space, process the data, and act at the edge may be our best approach against the kinds of strategies that China's putting out there. Yeah, agree and really appreciate the insight here. And we are running tight on time, but this report is really, really great to read and it's a great discussion. So to wrap it up, big picture, what should readers walk away with after reading this report? And are there things that are of particular importance that if you're in the military or industry or a congressional member? Yeah, I'll start uh, with three quick parting thoughts. I think our report really supports the need for CCAs without question and using them not just as adjuncts for crude aviation, manned aviation, but using them in different novel ways that are really gonna complicate uh, the PLA's operations. But we have to think through these CCAs from a force design perspective. Think it through as a system of systems. We, we must do additional analysis to figure out the battle management problem. As Mike Dom has just discussed, Battle management is going to be everything of a large number of these CCAs operating with crewed aircraft in highly contested airspace. That is a hard problem. And as Stutz said, the Air Force and defense industry should conduct those trade-off analyses to determine an optimal mix of CCAs in the Air Force's future force design. And those analyses should seek to balance CCA attributes such as their sizes, low observability ranges, mission systems, and, and other features that are going to drive their unit costs. And the balance should be based on missions the CCAs will perform and the degree of risk the Air Force wants to shift to these uncrewed CCAs. And finally, we also need analyses to determine the logistics and other capabilities that are going to need be needed to support a, a high tempo of CCA operations in the Pacific and other theaters. So those uh, assessments should address requirements to maybe pre-position some CCAs and the logistics in the Indo-Pacific, uh, where these CCAs should be dispersed, uh, how we're going to launch and recover them, and of course the material and personnel requirements to sustain their operations at scale, again, in the middle of a conflict. Yeah, on the threat side, I would say the PLA has built up capabilities that are tailor-made, specifically designed to defeat the United States Air Force and the U.S. Joint Force. The Chinese have our playbook, and if we keep running the same old plays with the same old players, we are going to get crushed. 
Here, here. That's awesome. We we get out of this in one of three ways. One, I get my throwaway Christmas wish every year, and there's going to be peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Two, a defense contractor develops a long-range magic weapon that wins the war. That's on every Pentagon office's Christmas list. Or three, we listen to the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future and realize that we are in an old-school dogfight. We need superior situational awareness, speed, and maneuverability. We need to innovate our technologies and operational concepts with agility and velocity and field those capabilities faster than the PLA to stay ahead of their ability to develop countermeasures. Absolutely. Okay, it falls to me to uh, kind of get to the basics of making what you said, Gonzo and Mike, what you said happen. Let me start by saying I want to highlight what the Secretary of Defense said this week, and I wrote this on a piece of paper uh, so I was accurate. He set out at the Reagan Forum, National Defense Forum, and let me be blunt about our mission. The U.S. military is here to win our country's wars and to win them decisively. Well, I don't get it. To do that, you need air superiority, where you slog through the destruction we see in Ukraine today. Our Air Force guys needs to recover. And I believe the senior leaders of the Air Force right now are, are somewhat constrained from speaking candidly to Congress about this. So we call out, you know, the Congress, the overseers, to immediately reprioritize resourcing for the Air Force, rebuild it. They need to visualize what it means to not have air superiority. And as CCAs provide a very innovative way to help fill the gap in capability, it can't come out of hide. The Air Force can't continue to consume itself to pay for its modernization. And uh, boy, we need air power to backstop all the service capabilities, or we're not going to win those wars decisively. I'll stop there, Slick. No, I agree. The alternative is we lose. We do. Well, gents, I cannot say thank you enough for the insight on this new report. Congratulations on this, uh, and I'm hopeful the leadership will follow the recommendations set forth in this report. So, again, thank you guys, and congratulations. Yeah. Uh, happy holidays to Slick and to all our listeners. Have a great one. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. You bet. And see, women. Oh, you're right. Uh, see you later, Slick. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas you think we should explore further. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and check six.